Daniel chapter uh, 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 11 and 12. Now we looked in the last session, Daniel 10, the context. Uh, Daniel praying, fasting, he saw the angelic uh, activity. And now the angel, said, I, the angel said, I came to give you understanding. Now here is the understanding. Remember back in Daniel chapter 10 verse 8, Daniel called it a great vision. In paragraph A, this is the fourth vision, the fourth and final vision. It starts off one verse. He gives a, a quick snapshot of the next 200 years. The kingdom of Persia lasted about 200 years. Then number two, they were taken over and conquered by Greece. Now the angel gives two verses to the, to the Grecian empire. That's about 200 years too. Then number three, he gives 16 verses to the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. And that is uh, obvious in the context that it's Assyria is king of the north and Egypt is king of the south. Now that's interesting that he gave one verse to the whole Persian empire, the mightiest empire in the history up to that time. Then only two verses to the Grecian empire, which was then the mightiest empire. It actually was bigger than Persia. But he gives 16 verses to this regional conflict. Because uh, in this, a number of things are happening. And we're not going to go into detail on this. Now notice that when it says kings of the north and kings of the south, the Bible gives direction related to the city of Jerusalem. So Syria is the country just north of Jerusalem, or Israel, and Egypt is just south. Now what happened over this uh, several hundred year period is the north would come down to fight the south. Then the south would riot, come up to fight the north. And every time they went up and down, they just tromped through Israel. They were not, Israel was not exactly their target. They were going after each other. But the Lord used this context in order to create the right environment for a people that would respond to the Lord in the way, in, a, in certain ways. So even this regional conflict plays into the end time storyline. Then number four, uh, verse 21 to 45 is about the Antichrist. But as you'll see, number uh, letter A, it's not only about the Antichrist. 21 to 35 is about Antiochus Epiphanes. Now most of you have been here for the whole seminar. You know it's that regional king that in the Syria area... And Antiochus Epiphanes fulfills a lot of what happens in verse 21 to 35, but he doesn't fulfill all of it. He fulfills part of it. So it has a dual fulfillment. Then in uh, paragraph B, verse 36, uh, I mean, uh, uh, where am I at here? Okay, yeah, B, that, I'm right. Okay, the, uh, we see the Antichrist, particularly his religious attitudes. It's all about how he views religion and what he values. Then in paragraph C, we see the Antichrist and his uh, military activities. And then number five, it ends with Israel's great deliverance and the resurrection of the dead. And all the saints through history are vindicated and the evil one is put into the lake of fire forever and forever. And that's how the book ends. Let's look at Roman numeral two. Introduction to Daniel chapter 10. Well, we know Daniel, I mean Daniel 11, the introduction. We know that Daniel 10 is the context for Daniel receiving this glorious vision. After 21 days, fasting and praying, he receives the most detailed and the longest prophecy on the end times in the whole of, of, of uh, the Bible in terms of just one prophecy. Daniel gains insight into five different areas. The Antichrist's political decisions, his religious attitudes, his military activities, goes on and describes the global context of the Great uh, Tribulation. I mean, it's, it's, it's really hot in the Middle East, but it's a global uh, tribulation. I've heard some people say, I don't want to be around Israel when that happens. What do you think it's going to be like a, a walk in the park in all the other nations? You want to be in the will of God. It's not Israel, not Israel, here, there. You want to be in the will of God, but I tell you, the whole earth is going to be troubled. There is not going to be some uh, escape place where there won't be pressures that are confronting the saints. And then uh, the final part of this is uh, Israel's great deliverance. 
Okay, I want to say again, paragraph C, that there's a dual fulfillment in verse 21 to 35. Partially fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, ultimately fulfilled by the Antichrist. Okay, let's go to page 100. Let's look at, we're going to go right to verse 36. We're skipping so much of, uh, of the chapter. And, that, and, the, and the details of chapter 11, we'll look at it, Daniel 102. Remember, this 10 sessions is Daniel 101. Next year is Daniel 102. And there's a Daniel 1010 and 120, but that's way beyond our pay grade. So that's for the angels and for the people that God visits in a special way. So we, we can take it the next notch up, and that's as far as we can go for now. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can tune into that next year one way or the other, or watch it on the archives if you want to track with us. Okay, so let's look at the Antichrist uh, religious attitudes. Now the reason that this mighty angel is revealing these details... It's not for entertainment. It's not just for curiosity. They are relevant details so we don't get offended that we're not passive about the conflict. We're girded for it. We're not offended like, God, where are you? And, I mean, everything went bad. He goes, no, I planned this from the beginning. This is all part of my plan. I am the Ancient of Days on my throne, and I want you to know the nature of this man because I want you prepared in your heart to trust me in it that it's not taking me by surprise at all. And it will also affect different activities going on in the nations. There's, so there's a relevant reason we need to know this activity. Well, let's read verse 36 and 37. Then the king... He was called the king back in chapter 8 as well, verse 23. So two times the Antichrist is called the king. He will be a political leader. He will be in the political arena. He he won't be be a a marketplace guy. He might be uh, in his early days, but he's in the political arena. That's clear. It says in verse 36, he will do according to his own will, that he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods, which is the God of Israel. He shall prosper until the wrath ordained against him is accomplished. God has already ordained he will be cut off in the wrath of God after three and a half years. But he will succeed until then. And so the saints are not supposed to see that three and a half year success and go, Oh, no. The prophecies aren't real. He will prosper. But only until the wrath that's ordained at the three and a half year mark comes against him and it will destroy him. And the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls are judgments that will be targeting the oppression of the Antichrist kingdom and the great harlot. And so he will be disturbed all along the way By Jesus, the greater Moses, releasing the plagues of Egypt on the end-time Pharaoh called the Antichrist, those plagues will be coming in response to the end-time praying church. It says here, he will prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. Verse 37, he will have, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor shall he desire, regard the desire of women. Nor shall he re- regard any religion whatsoever. When it says any God, it means there's no trace of religion that he will have any value or any patience for. But he will exalt himself above all of them. Above the God of his Father, above the desire of women, and above all religions. Every trace of religion, he will exalt himself above it. Okay, uh, look at number two. He will, it says this, he shall do according to his own will. He will have no fear of consequences at all. He will do what enters his heart. And somebody might counsel him and say, yeah, but if you do that, this block of nations will rise up against you. He says, I don't care. I have such superior power over that block of nations. It doesn't matter. There's nothing that will hinder him. There's no human obstacles that he will consider to slow him down. He will do every plan in his heart is what that means. Number three, he will exalt himself above every God. He will have unique political power. I mean, he'll be the most powerful political leader in human history up to that time. I mean, obviously, Jesus will be when he comes as king of kings, but up to that time. 
He will be the most powerful military. He have the greatest armed forces in the nations. He'll have the ten nations and other nations besides that ally with him. He'll have the greatest military force. He'll have the greatest economic abilities. He'll have the greatest religious power. There'll be, he'll have more devout people worshiping him than any other man. Now, again, not Jesus. We're talking about any other evil man or tyrant on the earth. Now, this superior power in these arenas will embolden his pride. And he will declare that he is God. And he will exalt himself above every god. Now remember the harlot Babylon religious system has been emerging in the earth. He will exalt himself above that system too. And when he's, when he's finished using that system, the ten kings that are allied with him, it says in Revelation 17, they'll burn that, they'll burn that whole system and they'll destroy it because he doesn't need it anymore. Okay, let's look at the top of page 101. Number four. He'll speak blasphemies. He'll claim things about himself that are shocking. I mean, it will excite his followers, but they, it will be absolutely shocking. He will speak with a terrible boldness against God. Look what it says in Revelation 13, that he was given a mouth to speak great things. And I think these great things mean he will say ideas of what he's going to do that are so unique Ideas that no one's ever thought of. They will be extraordinary. That's what it means, great. Unique, extraordinary, new. And when he announces it, people will gasp. Oh, that is the most amazing. Who has done such a thing? It's like we have back in Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar looked over his great city and his palace and his garden. And he said, only I have built something like this. Well, this will be that, but on a global level. A global level. And he will speak such unique, wonderful, powerful, extraordinary things that men will gasp in awe and wonder at this man. So it's going to be a problem to tell people on the front end that this man is Satan incarnate or he's demonized, the most demonized man ever, or he's a devil, whatever, some, whatever the language that people use. They will say, are you kidding? Have you heard them speak? And do you see the wisdom and the ability that he has and the kindness? And he can solve riddles and he can solve the problems of nations. How can you say that he's a devil? So this is what we're up against. But we understand this is where it's going. Number five, he shall prosper. Now look what it says in verse 36. He shall prosper until the wrath of God... Uh, uh, but only until the wrath of God that's determined on him is released. In other words, when he's finished serving God's purpose, God will destroy him. So don't be confused is what the body of Christ, is the message they're supposed to receive from this angel through Daniel. Don't be dismayed that he keeps on getting stronger and everything he touches seems to turn to gold for a short season. He will prosper till he's destroyed. Number six, this is a interesting one he will not desire he will not regard the desire of women some translate this he will not desire he will not des have desire for women meaning not, not it's not a sexual term uh, concept but he will hate women is the idea he will hate them now others tr uh, tr uh, read this differently and i'm guessing that's what it means but it might not exactly it might mean more than that but uh, I see the demonic activity that's increasing in the earth that has a distinct, a distinct mark of hatred for women that's exploding in the earth right now in human trafficking, the explosion of pornography, the oppression of women, that even through the social networking and the, inner, uh, and the whole technology, the ideas that men are getting emboldened with and awakened to in their youth that oppress and, and have perversion towards women and oppression towards women is exploding globally. And just by that very reality, I'm guessing that's what it means, that it's desire. He has no regard for women at all. It's just the mark of the enemy. I mean, the, the enemy's setting up the environment by the pornography explosion. 
I, I, I'm, I'm, we all know this, but whether male or female, old and young, we want to have absolutely zero to do with that. Absolutely zero to, the, to do with that. That is creating the context for many more things to happen in the next decade or two and beyond that are beyond anything we're imagining. I have written here in in paragraph A at at the middle, the desire of women is something that is related to God. Because in this verse, three things he does not have regard for. The first one, he has no regard for the God of Israel. The next thing, he has no regard for women. The next thing, he has no regard for, for gods or religion. So it's God, women, and gods. And so I'm imagining the no regard for women is somewhere related to God. It's not just a random subject. It's in the context of the three things he does not regard. God has such deep value for women. And the, and, and the ungodly uh, value of culture all through history is the opposite of God's value of women. I mean, God so values women. Look at paragraph B. He tells godly men, he goes, your prayers will be hindered if you don't value your wife. I mean, he so values women that a man that does not honor his wife, his prayers will not be effective. That tells you what God thinks about women. Even in the end time prayer movement, there is no going forward in prayer and in power without the value of women going parallel with it. Top of page 102. He will not regard the God of his fathers. He will show no regard for the God of his fathers or any other God. He will utterly despise the God of Israel. He will utterly despise religion. He will reject the religion of his ancestors. Paragraph A. Some people use this verse to make the case the Antichrist is a Jewish apostate, that he as a backslidden, he was a formerly devout Jew, and he's completely backslidden. Because the phrase, the God of his fathers, is clearly a phrase in the Old Testament that speaks of a devout Jewish believer, the God of his fathers. Only a devout Jewish believer would use that phrase. And so this is a, uh, uh, again, the, 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 the idea of this is that he has some kind of Jewish heritage or ancestry of some sort. I have here in paragraph A that uh, they think he, that he might grow up in a Jewish home. I think the, the text is inconclusive. You can't really draw the conclusion there, but you don't want to shut the door to it either. The reason, paragraph B, the God of his fathers can be singular or plural. It can be the God of his fathers or the gods of his prop fathers. If it's the gods of his fathers, then it's some kind of heathen religion. It's hard to say. But if it's singular, then it clearly has a Jewish connotation to it. You know, my theory is that people want to try to figure out who the Antichrist is. And there, I don't think there's any value in figuring out who he is till he makes the covenant with Israel. Until a man brings a covenant, a peace treaty for all the Middle East countries with Israel, that's number one. That's not enough. A man that does that, we go, oh, no, that's it. Well, there might be two or three of those covenants in the next number of years that are not the covenant. Well, how will we know? Well, he does several things. He makes the covenant. Then he empowers the Jewish people to start sacrifices again. Whoa, that will be a first. Then he helps them. He initiates the process where they can build the temple. Now, there's only one man that's going to make the covenant, bring peace, and enable them to start animal sacrifices of the Mosaic Law to the devout rabbis and has also built the temple because the Dome of the Rock's there. On the site, they have to build the temple, the third most uh, sacred site in the Islamic, uh, of, of, of all uh, the Islamic faith. The third most sacred site, and the most sacred site in Jerusalem is there. And somehow the Jewish temple has got to be there instead of the Golden Dome. And so that's going to be a problem. So when the man makes the peace, lets the temple get built on that site. I don't know how they're going to pull that off. And then allows the uh, Jewish sacrifices to to happen. Somebody said, well, maybe an earthquake will come and move it. Yeah, maybe. That would be uh, 
convenient of, to, to some people, but I don't know how it's going to happen, but that's the guy that we now say, there he is. There he is. And he kills three of the top ten kings in the nations. He kills them. He has them murdered. Ah, now we know for sure who he is, even before the abomination of desolation. Until then, all of these theories, you know, people have told me they have this, that. I go, I don't, I'm not even interested. Until the man makes the covenant, the, the sacrifice starts, the temple starts getting built, and he kills three of the top leaders of the earth, I don't even want to have a conversation. And then I don't even need a conversation after that. It will be super clear. <laughs> so I just give him Alan Hood's email address. And I said, Alan loves this stuff. I mean, just send it to him. And Alan goes, well, why did they send this to me? I go, oh, I'm just having fun with you. <laughs> I, I uh, was just, uh, we got to think outside the box because this man, it, I think his heritage will be so complex. Because some are, are really energized to make him Jewish by this one phrase. And by the idea that Jesus said in John 5, 43, he said, You will not accept me, he told the nation of Israel, but there is another coming who you will accept. And he meant in the messianic way. And people use that passage to say, see, they will accept him as his Messiah. And that might mean that. That really might and it might not. Again, it's not conclusive. But I think it's going to be complex. I think he's going to have, if I'm guessing, and this is purely a guess, so don't, don't, uh, I'll tell you when I'm uh, just guessing, and it's a theory. I think he's going to have Islamic roots and heritage. I think he's going to have some Jewish heritage. I think he's going to have a few other heritages involved as well. I don't even know. I'm just kind of thinking outside the box. You know, he might be born in Syria or, or Iraq. He may get his Ph.D. at the Hebrew University. He may go down to Cairo and have another Ph.D. He may go to London and practice law. Because he might, his political career may come out of that. And somebody goes, well, where is he from? Well, he was trained here. He was raised there. And he had his business there. But his first appointment in office might be in Iran somewhere. I mean, who knows? I mean, I, that's just completely, I, that's not even what I think will happen. But my point is, it's going to be probably so complicated. So I was writing a bunch of the options of what it, mo um, uh, it must be. And I wrote a paper just to myself, no, you can't have it. And the name of the paper, I wrote like all the bizarre options. And I, and I titled the paper, The Boy Named Abraham Muhammad Joshua. So it's the boys Abraham, well, the Muslims like it and the Jewish people like it, Muhammad, but his name's Joshua because that's the name for Jesus, the Savior, and he, I said, so the boy named Abraham, Muhammad, Joshua, with all this mixed bag, and he might be from a whole lot of places, so I don't think we want to be dogmatic and lock him into one thing, it's far, probably far more complex because his root system, his educational experience, his business practices, his political career might be from four different heritages and people groups bringing it together. And his Aunt Susie and his Uncle Tom may be in leaders in the Harlot Babylon religion or something like that. They're probably not Susie and Tom, so that was not a prophecy. So my point being, he might have relatives involved in all the other stuff. It could be the strangest thing you could imagine. So I think it's impossible to locate this ahead of time. But I think you think outside the box, it's going to be complex. And it will be strategically, uh, it will be very strategic how it happens. So anyway, I spent too much time on that. Paragraph C. He will not regard in religion. He'll have a total anti-God policy. Matter of fact, at the end, he's going to tell people, if you don't worship me, I'll kill you. That's what he tells them at the end. Number eight. Above them all, he shall exalt himself. That's what it says in verse 37. He will view himself above the God of his fathers. He will view himself above the desire of women, the concerns of women. He will view himself above. He says, what I, my, what's on my mind and heart and what I'm about is bigger than any religion. Paragraph B. Now we're going to look at his religious attitudes as seen in 
in his worship of war, he will actually worship the God of war. His God will be military conquest. That is what will grab him and fascinate him. I mean, he won't be a man that's easily fascinated by anything, but he will be fascinated by military conquest. That will be his God. That will be what grabs his attention like no other thing does. Paragraph, I mean, verse 37. But in their place, meaning in the place of the God of his father, the desire of women and regard for other gods or religion, in their place, he will honor a God of fortress. And I understand that to mean the God of military conquest or the God of war. This is a God his fathers did not know. If his heritage is, is Muslim or Jewish or Western or a combination of all of them, and again, if you, the heritage in all those different ways, none of his fathers will have any experience in this God of war. They won't be military people. And they won't have a history in demonic worship. Because we're going to find out that his God is military conquest combined with worship of demons, with Satan worship. That's the unique religion that fascinates his heart. And he won't have any heritage in that. His, his fathers and forefathers won't have a history in the satanic cults, nor will they have a history in the military. But he shall honor this God of fortress with gold and silver. And I think what that means is he's going to put tremendous amount of money into his military build-up program, his armament strategy to build up the military might. He will take gold and silver and put tremendous amounts of money into that. Verse 39, he shall act against the strongest fortresses. But he will act against the, the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. And I believe the foreign god is the demonic power. The foreign god is this combination of the god of military conquest with interaction with Satan himself and all the demons at his disposal. That's the foreign god that nobody around him has any, uh, associ I mean, any experience with. I mean, when he con it comes from military strategy, he won't go into his call his uh, uh, cabinet together and his military generals, he'll go into a room alone and he'll interact with demons for the strategy and come and deliver the edict to them. It's that kind of thing. I'm not saying that I'm, I, I'm, I'm grasping it exactly right, but it's, it's that kind of perception, and I'm sure some of these details are not exactly right. Verse 39, He shall act against the strongest fortress with this demonic help as to give him strategy, to give him power, to give him insight on the best way forward. Now, when he acts against the strongest fortresses, I believe the strongest fortresses mean he'll take on the superpowers. He'll look at the strongest military alliances, the strongest military nations or alliances, and he'll say, I'll take you on. I'm not backing down at all. I have superior power. I have power you know not of. And it will be true. And he will not back down from them because he has this interaction with the, the demonic realm giving him insight as well as different activities are happening related to this demonic activity. He goes on to say that he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And the it is the foreign God. He will acknowledge Satan as his source. And he will advance the cause of this God, this foreign God, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and he shall divide the land for gain. What I think that means is the foreign God and the God of war, that's his focus point. He wants to advance the glory of this. So he will acknowledge the demonic realm, and he will give promotions to the leaders under him, he goes, you will rule if you will join in at this level. I want you fully committed to the demonic realm with me, and I want you fully committed to obey me, as ruthless as I, as I am, I want you to go with me all the way, and I will advance you in terms of your position of authority in the government or the military or in economics. This is the very thing that uh, Adolf Hitler did. He took these 
these worthless fellows, and what I mean by that, these men that had no uh, competency in leadership. I mean, their backgrounds were, whole, I mean, untrained, brutal men, just thugs and, and gangsters, many of them. And he said, hey, you serve me, I'll give you positions in my government and in my army. He had no capacity to rule at all. And it goes on to say he'll divide the land for gain. He'll, and, and, and Hitler did the same thing. He would give uh, 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 certain ones of his leaders vast pieces of property, if, which are the spoils of war. If you will be loyal to me and jump in all the way into the spirit I'm operating in, which is a, the ultimate demonic spirit, in my opinion, up to that time in history, Adolf Hitler operated in, you've got you to gotta, uh, imbibe that spirit as well. You've got to be ruthless with me. And I'll give you properties as the, the spoil of war as my reward. And I'll give you a position of honor in the Third Reich. I, uh, that happened in history. I think this will happen in a far more sophisticated and a far grander scale. Grand's a hard word to use when you're talking about the Antichrist. A bigger scale in a more uh, dramatic way. Okay, let's go to uh, page 103. Okay, but in their place, we did that one. We did honoring... I think we did them all, okay? Yes, we did. Let's go to Roman numeral, the bottom of page 103, Roman numeral 5. Now we're switching over from his religious attitudes, the values that he had. What He despised religion, and the only religion he bought into was himself and military conquest and Satan. And everything else he put down. And he promoted those that would take hold of those values with him. Again, that's the kind of man we're dealing with. And when we call him a devil, many of the nations will say, how dare you say that? But beloved, we will have uh, uh, substantial evidence from the scriptures to the nature of how this man operates. Let's look at chapter 11, verse 40 uh, to 45. Now we look at his military activities. Now this section summarizes... Some of the Antichrist's more, most significant military campaigns. Now, paragraph B, the first point we want to make is there's a debate about these next few verses. And the debate is, because if you study it out in commentaries, you'll run into this debate. Are there two kings being referenced in verse 40 to 45, or are there three kings? If there's three kings, which is my opinion at this point in time, that that's the view, that's the, that's the accurate view, but I might be wrong. Because the other view has a, has a good case as well. The three kings, and we're not going to go into detail on this. I just want to alert you to it and give you a little bit of information. And you can uh, 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 look at it just to, at your own time, just to kind of get familiar with it. Paragraph B, the three king view is the Antichrist, the king of the north, the king of the south. That's the three king view. The king of the north is clearly Syria. The king of the south is Egypt. Some suggest Saudi Arabia, but Egypt seems like the best guess. The two-king view is that the king of the north is the Antichrist. So it's only the Antichrist against the king of the south and the others. And I think the king of the, the three-king view is uh, the most accurate. Again, some of you said, okay, I don't think I'm really there yet on this passage. So you don't have to worry about that. But uh, if that's something that kind of energizes you and you're reading other uh, commentaries on this, you'll want to answer that one way or the other to make sense of, of, of what's going on in there. Okay, let's look at the middle of page 104, Roman numeral 6. His military activities. Okay, let's read uh, uh, paragraph B, verse 40. At the time of the end, now, it's clearly the end time. This is still the mighty angel talking to Daniel. This is the, the same mighty angel that appeared in Daniel chapter 10. The angel with the face like lightning, the eyes like fire. And at the time of the end, and I believe that was an angel. I don't believe that was Jesus. Some commentators say, well, that was Jesus. And I don't think so. And there's five reasons for it, but I'm, I won't go into them now. But I do appreciate the view. I just don't think it's the right view. Because there's some really smart guys who think that's just a pre-incarnate uh, 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 appearance of Jesus uh, to Daniel. And there's several reasons why I don't think it is, but uh, again, that's not my point right now. But verse 40, this angel tells Daniel, this at the end of, at the time of the end, at the end times, the king of the south, Egypt, 
shall attack him, the Antichrist. And the king of the north, Syria, shall also attack him. So I'm assuming this is a preemptive strike. They're seeing the buildup of power. And Egypt and Syria have not really been great friends over the years. But somewhere they, they, they figure out we have to attack him first before he attacks us. They have no idea who this man is and the nature of who he is. They think he's just an aggressive new leader on the scene, and let's attack him while he's new. They don't realize that he has uh, descended and ascended from the pit after he died. They don't know he's that kind of man. And that Satan has given all of his authority and his kingdom and his throne to him. So the Egyptians and the Syrians will attack him. And they will attack him in full force. I mean, this won't be kind of a warning sound. They're going to come like a whirlwind. With all of their military force, they're coming after him. And then he's going to be stirred up. And he shall enter the countries. Those two countries particularly, but more than those two, he shall overwhelm them. He will overwhelm those two countries and many others besides. And he will pass through with his whole army. He will pass through these. And just all the carnage that happens when the most wicked army of the earth tramples through your land. And there's many implications to that. Okay, let's look at paragraph C. This is just a thought. Syria in the north, it seems like it's more than just Syria, the king of the north. He may be, it might be, Syria might be the leading nation in a northern confederacy. I can't imagine Syria taking on this king by himself, but, it's, but the king is new on the scene, so maybe they're emboldened, but maybe there's a northern confederation that are joined with him. That's just a theory. Different ones have, have promoted that. I thought, that's yeah, possible. Like an Islamic Arab bloc from the north coming down to attack him. I don't know. Top page, page 105. Then Egypt in the south. And it might be the same thing. I, I'm not sure that it is. I, I've, I've read it from others. I've got the idea from others. I thought that's possible. It might be a southern con confederation of several nations in alliance together. Let's go down to Roman numeral 7. It says in verse 41. He shall enter. He, number one, in verse 40, he's passing through all of these nations, overwhelming them. And tramping through the nations with his army. Verse 41, he shall enter the nation of Israel, the glorious land. That's clearly the nation of Israel. Many nations shall be overthrown. Many shall be overthrown. We don't know how many. Remember, there's, 280, uh, uh, there's 238 nations. And, or thereabouts, because the number changes a little bit. But that's kind of a number a lot of folks use. 238 nations, and so 10 kings are with him, so that's 10. And even if many join him, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, who knows, there's still a lot that he influences them negatively, and he threatens them, but he does not dominate them. Don't have the idea that because his spiritual influence is in all the nations, and his oppression will touch all the nations, but his dominance won't touch all the nations. He never succeeds in dominating the nations. It never happens. Before he can succeed, Jesus, the Son of Man, returns and destroys him. So he only gets, he gets further than any other tyrant in history, but he doesn't get near as far as he wanted. But he does have many nations under him. We don't know the number. But we don't want to have a, though we want to take the Antichrist very seriously, we don't want to take it, we don't want to exalt him beyond the measure of where he's at, but I don't think most are exalting him beyond, most are just kind of, it's just kind of a, a, a fun idea, kind of like Bible Jeopardy to play, you know, games with just to figure out different things about him. And he's not a real figure that's going to appear possibly in their lifetime to trouble their nation. And so, but the day's coming where we're going to shift from it just being an idea that we toy with to it's going to be a real man that's going to actually trouble the nations of the earth in a way that's hard to even imagine. Verse 41, he shall enter the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Now, it's interesting. Those are all three nations a part of modern-day Jordan right now. And somebody goes, well, why, is he, why are they uh, 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 
escaping his oppression. Maybe they're cooperating with him in some way. We don't know. But uh, you think, wow, well, they certainly got a free pass. Well, maybe not, because this is the same area in Isaiah 63 where Jesus marches up through Edom and this property and, he, and, and this territory, and he's killing the enemy armies, and blood is splashing on his garments. Isaiah 63, it's this, arm, it's, it's this territory he marches through, and he's marching through for judgment, and this is where it's first noted in the Scripture. And so I'm sure there's a tie-in to it, but I don't know what it all is. Let's go to paragraph C. Many countries shall be overthrown. And I just uh, uh, talked about that just then. So let's go to Roman numeral uh, 8. Now he's, verse 42 and 43, he'll attack Egypt. Well, Egypt attacked him first. Because Egypt was uh, rightfully nervous of his emerging power. And he will overthrow Egypt in a temporary way. Verse 42, he will stretch out his hand against the countries. He, all the countries around, he will uh, put his hand at them because he wants to dominate them all and then have them worship him. But the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over their economics, their gold and their silver. He will uh, uh, occupy Egypt, and he will have authority over their national economy. And, of course, if he has authority over that, and he dominates their army because he defeated them or he couldn't, come, he couldn't come in to the land like that, then it's, a, it's and you read Isaiah 19. Matter of fact, on the, on the final version of these notes, I'm, I'm putting out an updated version of these notes. They're probably going to be changed 5% each one. I'm adding a few verses and... And uh, there's a couple little corrections I'm making that will be uh, on the website in the next couple of days. But uh, in that, I have a whole uh, maybe six or seven, eight page handout about uh, Syria, the king of the north, and Egypt, the king of the south, and what's going to happen to those nations from Isaiah chapter 19. There's quite a bit of this story that is told in Isaiah 19 that's not told here that we didn't have time to go through. And, uh, and, and so I'm adding those to the notes, and that will be on the Internet. For those that are really saying, hey, I want to go after this. I want to really grasp this. And I know some of you feel that way. Let's go to top of page 106. Verse 44. But news from the east and news from the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate those in the east and the north. So there's these, there's countries that are outside of his dominion, it seems like. At least in the east. I think possibly that the countries in the north might be his own people. And let me break that down for a minute. Paragraph B. The north here in verse 44, I don't believe is the king of the north throughout all of Daniel 11. I don't believe it's Syria. Because Ezekiel 38 tells us that in the far north, there is a coalition of armies that are brought together under the Antichrist power. So there's the far north in Ezekiel 38, and there's the immediate north in Daniel 11. And the, the immediate north is Syria throughout Daniel 11, but I don't think this is Syria. I don't think that he's now talking about Syria under a different uh, uh, title here or a different uh, uh, description. I think it's possibly his own ranks that there's some kind of division in them. Possibly. Yeah, this could be wrong. The north, the far north could be another uh, block of people up in the former Soviet Union, nations, etc. Because always, remember, north and south, east and west in the Bible is in relationship to the city of Jerusalem. So it's north of Jerusalem, far north of Jerusalem. Look at paragraph 1. Remember the, the uh, uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2. And the young prophet Daniel I mean, just a, just a teen or just 20 years old about just, just whatever, he uh, gets the interpretation of the dream. And that fourth empire, which the Antichrist empire, ultimately, verse 41, it was partly clay and partly iron because the kingdom will have division in it. Now, we know that the, these ten kings are of one mind, 
certainly for a, 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 a good portion of the three and a half years, but it's possible because of their different backgrounds, they're, I mean, none of them have a good spirit. They're all demonized. It's not like they're kind and yielding and, and they're deferring to one another's honor. They're, they have the spirit of their father, the devil, who's a liar and a murderer, and they're all liars and murderers. And so it's possible that the north, this is, a, a, again, I think it's a plausible theory, but it's, you can't say for sure, is possibly his own ranks. And, but anyway, he's, he's getting stirred up, and he's going to go make them pay. And it may be another set of nations in the north, but I don't believe it's Syria. Let's look at paragraph C. What about the east? Well, John, in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, talks to us about the kings of the east. The kings in the east trouble him. And this is a paragraph C. This is an amazing uh, fact, in, in my opinion, that in Revelation 16, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, so just, just say it ever so brief. This is the last days, the last moments before, the last days before, I mean, I mean literal days, week or two, that type of thing. Week or two or three, something like that, before the Lord comes. This is the very end of the three and a half years. The kings of the east have still not yielded to him. I mean, this Asian bloc, they have resisted his financial seductions. Because you can be sure he wants Asia under him. They go, he goes to Asia and says, hey, Asia, you know, I, I, I want you to know you're going to get real wealthy if you join me. And they go, no. Okay. Really? No? Okay. He says, well, how about this? He does miracles. A lot of other kings are joining them. The Asian kings go, no. Okay, you don't, the money won't get you. The miracles won't get you. Then he threatens them, I'm going to destroy you. And the Asians go, no, we're not joining you. And I mean, they don't join him the whole three and a half years to the final weeks, literally the very minutes before it's all over. My question is, why are the kings of the East so resilient against the Antichrist's seductions and his threats and his great miracles? Why? Why? What's, what's the story behind the scenes that we don't have in Revelation 16? I mean, this is so intense. He is so frustrated with, with, with the kings of the East. They won't join him. So finally, if you read uh, Revelation 16, it's the only time in history this happens. You find it in uh, verse uh, 13. Satan... The Antichrist and the false prophet, to three together, they say, let's go visit them. They said, we can't get anybody to make them yield. I mean, this is intense. You know what? That this is the only time in history, besides the Garden of Eden, where Satan came on the public stage, instead of being the puppet master behind the scenes pulling the strings, he comes on the stage, he goes, Asia! Get with it, because all of these years they won't. And the question is, why won't they yield? I believe because the greatest prayer movement in history is going to be happening in Asia. I really believe that. I really believe this. I believe this is about the prayer movement. Now, Revelation 16 doesn't say the prayer movement, but it just tells you they don't yield to just minutes before the very end. And I think that all these kings of Asia... They got wives or husbands or children or uncles and aunts and friends that are on fire, prophetic believers, dreams and visions. And when they have their family gatherings, these guys hear so much. They go, oh, don't tell me no more. But it just holds them at bay. And I believe that just the prayer movement is just the angelic dimension resisting the demonic venture. I don't know the whole story, but there's something dynamic about Asia at the very end still troubling the Antichrist. They won't yield to him. Page 107. Verse 45. Then he shall plant the tents of his palace, in essence, in Jerusalem. And but it makes clear he shall come to his end and nobody will help him. Well, because nobody's able to help him. It's not like they all abandoned him. He will come to his end, and there's no military alliance that he's garnered the loyalty of over the years that will have the ability to, to, to intervene because it's the, it's the son of David. 
It's the king of the nations is who's standing before him. Look at paragraph C. I know I've used it in like all 10 sessions, this verse, but I love this verse. Jesus marches into Jerusalem. And there's the Antichrist with all the armies surrounding him. And he looks at him. And he breathes. He goes, <laughs> and consumes this most powerful man in front of all of his generals and all of his align kings. The kings aligned with him in front of the global stage. All the kings are there. And Jesus stands before him. And he is a. Uh, uh, a promise them that the Antichrist has that he's the real deal and Jesus of Nazareth is the counterfeit. And he stands in front of him, all the kings of the earth. Never ever in one city have all the kings of the earth ever gathered, only here. And Jesus wants them there to see this. And then Jesus is going to kill them too. So he gathered them there to see the Antichrist go down and then to literally to execute and kill them. That's what really happens for real. So first, Jesus stands off, and I can just imagine the David, Goliath, the two armies standing at each other, and Goliath is there, the raging, you know, fury of the Antichrist, threatening, and all the show of power, and Jesus goes, (laughs) then he's on the ground, and then Jesus stares at him, by the very brightness of his countenance, he destroys him. Page 107. Let's bring this to an end here. The vision isn't over. The Antichrist is destroyed, but there's still three more verses in the vision. The vision ends in chapter 12, verse 3. So the angel looks at Daniel. Remember, Daniel fainted and was overwhelmed and lost his strength when he saw this angel. This angel has told him step by step the most detailed unfolding of history. And the angel says, i got to tell you this. The Antichrist is going to invade your nation. But I want to promise you this, two things. Michael is going to arise, and he's going to help you. Just like Michael has helped us just now in this battle, right now in Daniel 10, it's the same vision, he is going to rise and help at the end of the age, but in a global level. But it's not going to end there that just Michael's going to rise. All the martyrs are going to rise too. They're going to rise from the dead. Everybody that lost their life and all the others as, as well. They're all going to rise from the dead. They're all going to rise from the dead together. I heard someone ask a question today in Revelation 20 that is it just the martyrs? No. The martyrs are identified because they are facing the most brutal, cruel resistance. So they get a special mention. But the passage in Revelation 20 does not limit it to the martyrs. All the saints are raised from the dead at the same, in, this, in, this, in, the, in the same resurrection event. So verse 1, he says... Daniel, I have good news for you. And the way that Michael just helped us, he is going to rise again. Now, I think this is the Revelation 12 when he arises to help Israel. He will stand up. And the great prince, the archangel, who stands watch over your people, Michael's assignment is particularly for the nation of Israel, there will come a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation at that time. That's the great tribulation verse that Jesus quotes in Matthew 24, 21. Jesus quotes this angel telling this to Daniel. But he says, yeah, I have good news. It's going to be rough, but the people of Israel will not only be delivered, all of the fullness of the promises will be given to them that God promised. Verse 2, well, what about the martyrs and all the others? What about the saints of old? That's one question. But more prevalent, what about the ones that have been slaughtered in the carnage? The angel says, I want you to know this. Those that are asleep in the dust of the earth, they will awake. When it says many that are asleep in the dust of the earth will awake, he's talking about the multitudes of the saints through history. But he says they will awake to everlasting life. But there's others that shall be awakened too. They're in their graves too. The unbelievers, they shall be raised to everlasting contempt and shame. Then he goes on in verse 3 and he goes, I want to give you one last, the angel gives this one last uh, exhortation in this, in this vision. And then the angel interprets a few things for him after that. 
He said, I want to tell you again, those that are wise shall shine like brightness. And it doesn't mean wise like they have real good business skills or they know the book of Proverbs. That's not the wisdom he's talking about. Like they really know how to run an organization. They have a spirit of wisdom. That's powerful and that's real. He's not talking about wise in terms of that way. He's talking about they have the understanding. It's very clear in the rest of the chapter. They have understanding of what's happening. That's the wise. They grasp the storyline. It's not just they're good business leaders. They grasp what's happening and they make it known. They shall shine like the brightness of the firmament or the stars. That's the same thing as the the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness will shine like stars. Now some people have limited this verse, those that turn many to righteousness, to soul winners who lead somebody to uh, their initial salvation experience. And certainly it does mean that. But it means much more than leading somebody to their their initial salvation experience. If you're one of those people who are using your influence to talk people into righteousness. I mean, there's a great crisis in the body of Christ right now. So many voices in the body of Christ are giving a biblical logic for unrighteous lifestyles. And Jesus said, and I'll I'll just bring this to an end, but he said in Matthew 5, 19, he said... For those that will talk people into obeying the Sermon on the Mount, and they won't reduce it at all, they will be called great in my kingdom. Jesus is saying, for the men and women, it doesn't matter how big your platform is, you use your sphere of influence. You might only have three people listening to you. You may have many more. You use your influence to talk people into righteousness. You don't talk them out of righteousness using the Bible. And again, there's this growing sign of the time of the apostate church emerging with this biblical rhetoric of how the grace of God empowers people to live uncommitted and passive, and that is somehow an expression of Jesus did it for us. So we can live spiritually passive and rejoice in the cross without living out the implications of this amazing giving of himself at the cross for us. And the angel says here, he says, if you will turn people to righteousness, you use your influence, whether it's believers or unbelievers, you turn people to radical obedience. The angel says, go tell them this, they shall shine forever. Jesus actually quotes this, paragraph C. He actually quotes this later, and he says, I want you to know, those righteous men and women, you may, not, you may only have influence over three people. You may not be known by anybody. You may not have any of the giftings or the platform or the ministry that the other guy has that you look at, but you've got a humble heart and you turn people to righteousness in as much as you have the ability to. It may be your three grandchildren and the only people that listen to you, but you're turning them to righteousness. So don't... Re- d- d- don't uh, Uh, figure your way out of this because you don't have the school or you don't have the education, you don't have the money, you don't have the the platform. You turn your children, you turn three kids in the neighborhood to righteousness. Maybe you're 18 years old, start now. Jesus said, you do that. He quotes Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, you'll shine like stars. I promise you that angel said to Daniel the truth. And final point I want to make is go back to verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake. Many of those that sleep in the dust shall awake. Beloved, the martyrs are only asleep. Honestly, we're just asleep. The martyrs are just asleep, and all the saints are just asleep when they die. Again, like I said before, some people's goal in life, they, they approach the end time. How can I avoid dying? The goal isn't to avoid dying. That's not the goal of life. The goal is to be faithful. We're not trying to put all of our energy to figure out how we can never, ever be under pressure. That's not the goal of the end time storyline. It's to be empowered in faithfulness. And look here in paragraph B, 1 Thessalonians 4. I'll just read it. For the Lord himself, when he, he will descend with a shout from heaven. He will come with the voice of the archangel. This is the son of man that's on the clouds from Daniel 7. He will come with the trumpet of God. And the dead, all the martyrs and all the others, of course, they will rise first. Then we who are alive, Paul thought he was going to be there. He threw we in. 
And those that are, we're remaining until the coming of the Lord, we will be caught up together. That's the phrase where we get the Latin word rapture from that phrase right there. We will meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. And we shall be with the Lord forever and forever and forever. Amen and amen. Let's all stand.